sold on the cheap. A lot of uh, surplus motorcycles were converted back to civilian use. You know, were repainted from uh, army khaki into uh, any colour as long as it's black kind of thing uh, to get Britain uh, mobile again. We're getting a proliferation again of bikes. We've got the ones now from the 20s and 30s. Obviously, the second-hand market grows, the more bikes there are around. Um, so they're becoming more available. In amongst all the austerity, there was a dream bike that offered a glimpse of what the future might hold. A hand-built fantasy for motorcycle fans that contrasted deeply with the world around it. The bike to end all bikes. The Vincent Black Shadow. It was the ultimate, it were, and rightly so, you know. They couldn't find a road fast enough to test it on, to do that, even though there was no speed limit. Like they used to do all the testing on the A1 at dawn. It's standout feature visually was it had a uh, all-black engine and it had a five-inch speedometer. No! Did you ever hear such a noise? For buyers with lots of cash, there's the Vincent HRD. Most expensive bike on view, costing near £600. Its cooler-than-cool looks made it a pin-up for British enthusiasts. But its real claim to fame was speed. A highly tuned version of the Black Shadow was taken to the western US state of Utah in 1948 and on the Bonneville Salt Flats made history. The American rider in the desert stripped down to his as to a pair of bathing trunks and uh, flattened himself along the tank and the seat of the bike. Road at 150 miles an hour like that, and in a straight line. I mean, these guys were heroes. It's an unbelievable speed um, for those days. Vincent's design stood out in an era of making do as a symbol of progress and engineering skill. They were in another quantum leap in terms of performance. Even on British roads, unthinkable speeds could be achieved. To be able to do 110 was incredible, but to be able to hold 110 with not, no bits falling off and, uh, you know, no, nothing going bang was, was phenomenal. Record-breaking speed and technical innovation didn't bring the Black Shadow social approval. Bikes had a bit of an image problem. And despite Vincent's state-of-the-art designs, they ceased bike production in 1955. It wasn't like having a sports car. Even though it was horrendously expensive, it, it was still a motorbike um, and tired with that, with that brush. Britain was also changing. Society was on the move. Expanding road networks and new out-of-town suburbs drove a boom in the demand for personal transport. As consumerism took hold in the 1950s, the middle class increasingly wanted cars rather than motorbikes. Cars were aspirational status symbols, and they kept you warm and dry. Uh, every man's got a car. Poor man, a rich man. You can't keep him the poor man up because he's a poor man or a working man. He's just entitled to have a car on the road as you are. And it wasn't just aspirations that were evolving. If grown-ups wanted cars, there was a new group that would take motorbikes off their hands. Teenagers. Don't jump, little kill and jump. We gonna jump, little kill and jump. We gonna jump, little kill and mother and father gone. You're beginning to get youth subcultures emerging after the war. And it's part of a whole debate in society about these new youths, these young people who are having more money, who are having more independence, the old traditions of respect, whether it's for your parents, for the church, for the establishment, for parliament, whatever, 
All of those things are under threat in the post-war period. Motorcycles and scooters, of course, become part of that youth generation. The generation gap becomes a social concern. The anxiety around teenagers and motorbikes was quick to set in. Marlon Brando's 1953 film, The Wild One, ignited a full-blown moral panic with its portrayal of delinquent bad boys on motorcycles. Brando's sneering, disdainful performance captured a threatening sense of rebellion that was emphasised by the film's use of costumes. The gang's black leather jackets in stark contrast to the ordinary townsfolk. The director made Brando's Johnny menacingly disengaged from authority figures. And the artistic mix worked so well that British censors banned the film. Where's that bunch from? I don't know, everywhere. I don't even think they know where they're going. Termites, nutty. Ten guys like that give people the idea everybody drives a motorcycle is crazy. The British Board of Film Censors described it as a spectacle of unbridled hooliganism. When that hooligan happened to be riding a triumph, it was no wonder British youths took his image to their hearts. For teenagers, bikes were a way of marking themselves out from the rest of society. They might not always have been able to get the fastest and flashiest around, but for some, it became a lasting love affair. I was 14, and it was a Norton 600, and it had a sidecar on it, and I gave 10 bob for it. My first motorcycle was a, a XWD 350 Matchless. When you're 16, it gets in there permanent for the rest of your life, like riding a bike. Teens created a motorbike scene all of their own, and transport cafes were the centre of this new world. Racing from venue to venue, the cafe racer had come of age. Young people are hanging out. I mean, maybe they're not old enough to drink yet, they're not able to take part in pub culture, but they also me don't necessarily want to be part of pub culture, which is association with the older generation. I mean, then, them days then, it was coffee. No one drunk. No one would drink a beer. No, no drink. Dr drugs, what's drugs? No one knew what drugs was. But it, it was clean, it was good, clean fun. Cafe racers spanned the country. There was soon a place for riders to hang out in every city. The notorious Ace Cafe's position on the inner London Ring Road made it the pit stop of choice for many of the capital's young riders. It was whizzing around North London, it could be in Birmingham or Manchester. Huge demographic explosion, fast bit of road, neon, a soundtrack, then new soundtrack, rock and roll music. And you've got the Busy Bee, you've got the Ace Cafe and they're going to be riding their bikes backwards and forwards to them. They're just whizzing around from cafe to cafe, hence the term, cafe racer. You finish work, had your dinner, eight o'clock, time to go. What you have is, in the late 50s and early 60s, you have the first generation of post-war young men that haven't been conscripted. They are living in a world where their working conditions, pay, holidays are improving all the time because of government legislation. You also have greater availability of credit, so they're buying motorcycles on credit, they can buy clothing on credit. Bikes had long ceased to be just forms of practical transport or playthings of the elite. Now they were objects of youthful desire, and they went to the heart of the identity of those who rode them. Like any new social scene, biking would develop its own strict styles, code, and culture. The image of a rocker back then was um, motorbike boots with um, white socks going over. The actual reality of it was um, you'd be quite posh to, to be able to afford proper motorbike boots. 
a lot of Les I hung around with, they either wore Wellingtons, <laughs> were, were turned down, <laughs> it was a fashionable thing, um, or, or, or ex-army boots. Light blue jeans were, were a thing that rockers were, were synonymous with, but that's because I was cheap. The look of the ton-up boy and rockers didn't always have room for crash helmets. Some people just didn't wear them because they didn't really take much attention to risk or there was just a, too much of an expense. Some did. Generally, we only wore a crash helmet if it was if you knew it was going to be really cold, or if we was going on a long run, so if we was back in end days, a long run would be Brighton. <laughs> the bikes weren't so reliable, um, but you'd wear a crash helmet, not for safety, but for more to, to keep the elements at way. He didn't really wear a helmet because them days, Billy Fury days, and a crash helmet mucked your hair up. The thought of putting this thing on you, A, it didn't look so good. <laughs> B, it flattened your bouffant, your hair. When you arrived at the Ace Caf, you had the big quiff, forward with the bill cream, it looked right. When you had a helmet on, it was hassle, it, mucked you up. it just mucked your hair up. Because it wasn't law at the time, I think the reason you didn't have to wear a helmet, so you never knew the difference. And I used to just love going along with the wind roaring through my hair and... You do see some fantastic um, caps being worn, kind of white topped dark peaked helmet with a chain across the front and it's a very stylized look. One particular item of clothing though was not only set to define the bikers as rebels but destined to become a universal and lasting fashion icon. <laughs> If you could afford one, a leather jacket was the essential bike accessory. You start to see the, the American influence come in with the black leather jacket, which has its roots in a few different areas, but primarily you know, almost a direct appropriation of military uh, uniforms. Almost all of us wore leather jackets. I mean, my first leather jacket I got when I was 14. Most of my mates couldn't afford new leather jackets, so we had, we had like a hand-me-downs from, from the Tunnock boys. Often bought from military surplus, it was these symbols of rocker life that disturbed older generations. You can do a direct image comparison between the black leather jacket and the German tank crews. The silhouette and the design, the lapels, is almost identical. The patches and customised designs on the jackets carried other connotations for those who had witnessed the Second World War. You're 16, 17, you suddenly get a motorcycle, you put on a leather jacket, so you have patches on the arms, you have patches and badges on, on the front of the jacket. You also have insignia being painted uh, on, on the back as well. Your parents, who may have seen lots of images or actually been to war themselves and, and you know, been close up with the enemy, are going to draw some comparisons to all of this. Their uniform is black leather. Their hair, a sergeant major's nightmare. And the two words on everyone's lips, the tongue, 100 miles an hour. The growing distance between the leather-clad upstarts and wider society became most apparent when the rockers got on their bikes. Roads were a Wild West frontier of unrestricted speed. We used to race from one roundabout to the other. And you, you'd go up and down there, and we found that you went up and down four or five times, and someone would have phoned the police, so the police would arrive, so you'd go up and down twice. The cafe racer lifestyle was a dangerous one. Britain's roads were being improved, traffic was growing, and around transport cafes, Leaking lorry oil added to the hazards of riding fast. Now you don't think of risk, or don't think of risk now. Youngsters wanting to show off to each other will come past here flat out. And flat out on an old brick bike is in somewhere perhaps 80 mile an hour, and on certain machines perhaps just over 100 mile an hour. Leading the way was the ton up boy committed to going as fast as possible, regardless of the consequences. You come into these cafes and you meet them. You meet the, the, uh, the ton-up boy. You meet the, the, the rogue, like, you know. 
he, he won't bother about what what you think of his driving. 